Hey everybody, Johnny here, and today we're going to be talking about the state of Texas after the Civil War. Texas was one of the last holdouts of the Confederacy, and slavery continued in Texas several years after the actual Civil War had come to an end. In this video, we're going to take a look at the diverse group of people who found themselves in the state of Texas at the end of the Civil War, and how a short-lived Republican government attempted to secure civil rights for African Americans in a state that refused to repent of rebellion. This is the Black Republicans of Texas. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel below. I make lots of great videos like this. I also interview people. So please become a subscriber to this channel. You will not be sorry. All right, well, let's get started with the presentation. We begin with a question I like to begin any presentation with. How did we get here? How did we get to the point where this story begins? What was the lead up to the Black Republicans of Texas? Our story begins in 1865 when the Civil War comes to an end. Texas, which is located very, very far away from Washington, D.C., carries on as usual, as though nothing had happened. The state is full of slaveholders who are escaping the Union Army. Abraham Lincoln has issued an Emancipation Proclamation. All slaves in any state or part of a state, the people whereof shall be in rebellion against the United States. The slaves in those states are free. So we have slaveholders escaping the other states of the Confederacy as the Union Army floods into the region. But it's not just the Union Army that the slaveholders were attempting to escape. They were also trying to get away from the meddlesome Confederate government. Now, this might seem a little counterintuitive. After all, the Confederacy fought to protect and preserve slavery. But in its desperation to beat the Yankees, the Confederate government was often confiscating slaves from area farms and impressing them into service, putting them to work on the forts, having them harvest crops for the feeding of rebel soldiers. Slave labor was a cornerstone of the Confederacy, and so they relied heavily on slave impressments, which pushed many slaveholders, many greedy slaveholders, and I know that sounds redundant, but these are particularly unpatriotic <laughs> slaveholders, who are running as fast as they can with their tail between their legs into Texas in order to get away from Confederate impressments. As a result, over 150,000 slaves were brought to Texas during the war. Many of them came from as far away as the state of Virginia. For many of those who migrated to Texas, it was kind of like a trail of tears for slaves. Many of them walked hundreds of miles for months on foot and along the way with terrible weather conditions and difficulty finding food, many people, including young babies, died on these mass migrations into Texas. And you can see right here a poster that was put up in the Confederacy, wanted 200 Negroes. For everyone furnished, including cooks, the quartermaster's department will pay $125 per day. Owners to feed them, tents and shelter will be provided by the government. The government is trying to compensate slaveholders for the use of their quote unquote property. But for many of the slaveholders, a buck 25 a day is not enough. Remember that slavery was a multi billion dollar industry. And so to just give up that labor for a measly 125 a day was not something that the slaveholders were very incentivized to do. Here we see a political cartoon from the time. Proclamation, a day of fasting and prayer, signed by Jeff Davis. And you can see Jeff Davis with his horns. So this is clearly a northern cartoon. <laughs> He's very skinny, as are all of his constituents. Even the dog is drooping there in the front. This is the condition that the Confederacy was in, especially in the later years of the war. Starvation stalked the land. Inflation was a huge problem, and Confederate money became very worthless the longer the war went, especially because Confederate money was only going to be worth something if the Confederacy won. And the longer the war went, the more seeping doubts started to creep in about whether the Confederacy could actually pull this off. And so it was in this condition, in this state of affairs, that the Confederacy resorted to impressment of slaves, which caused many of their supporters to flee. So let's take a look at the state itself, Texas, where these slaveholders and enslaved people are finding themselves at the end of the war. Texas was the most pro-secession, the most pro-slavery state in the Confederacy at the time the Civil War broke out. 
It had the highest percentage of yes votes at its secession convention of any of the states that seceded, 166 to 8. Nevertheless, Texas is not super glued to the cause of the Confederacy. Texas is super glued to the cause of Texas. It secedes because it feels that slavery is under attack, and so it joins with the other states in solidarity to protect slavery. But it is not super loyal to the Confederate government. Texas will see itself as a fiercely independent entity, and this will often prove to be a problem for the central government. Texas is also full of deserters, people who have left the army. How unpatriotic can you get? There's even talk of a second secession at the end of the Civil War. The only reason Texas was in the United States is because it had seceded once from Mexico and then was annexed as part of the United States. There was a whole war, Mexican-American War, that took place to bring Texas into the Union. But now Texas is talking about seceding again. Anti-Northern sentiment is feverish in Texas. In many ways, the Texans hate Northerners more than any other type of person that we're gonna see in this presentation, including newly freed people. Can't stand those meddlesome Yankees. We talked about the slave migration boom a little bit earlier, 182,566 slaves in the state at the time, a little more accurate figure than we saw earlier. Out of the 600,000 black people that lived in Texas, only about 350 were free. So this is a super pro-slavery state. Now that the Civil War is over, the Emancipation Proclamation has been issued, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution has banned slavery, and so the question becomes, what is to be done about all the recently displaced freed people in the state? If any of you have ever read the book of Exodus in the Bible, the first third of the book is escaping from slavery. The whole entire rest of the book, most of the book, is about what the Israelites did after they escaped slavery. So we're going to be looking at the second half of the African-American book of Exodus here. What is to be done about the newly freed people? Unfortunately, they face a slew of unrepentant Confederates who are sheltering in Texas, including many who had escaped the other Confederate states once they had fallen under Union control and had come to Texas specifically to hide away from the authorities. Texas is a great place to hide out. It's a lot like, let's say, Afghanistan. There's a lot of forbidding landscapes, deserts. There's some mountains. It's a great place to hide out if you're trying to get away from the authorities. But these unrepentant Confederates are doing a lot more than hiding. They are making their presence known, especially to the newly freed population and to the Northerners that have come into the region. You can see right here, this is a cartoon from a Southern newspaper which depicts a donkey, the representative of the Democratic Party with KKK written on it. Today, we would look at that and say, how dare they accuse the Democrats of being KKK? But this cartoon is actually saying that being KKK is good. This is a pro-KKK, pro-Democrat newspaper from the 1860s. It is also promoting lynching. Lynching of two men, one who holds a bag that says Ohio. So these are northerners who have come into texas with the union army to try to reorganize the state and the kkk is the last bastion of salvation for the southern people right and so they're going to hang and kill northerners so let's take a, a moment here and get to know one of the people who's going to be an important part of this story because he represents the incredible transformation that the state of texas goes through during this time and his name is william parsons he was born in 1826 in the state of New Jersey. When he was a small child, his father moved them to Montgomery, Alabama, where he became a slaveholder. In 1844, Parsons enlisted in the Mexican-American War, which brought Texas into the Union. He fought under General, later President, Zachary Taylor. And after the war, he settled in the new state of Texas. In 1860, the year before the Civil War, Parsons founded his own newspaper in Waco, Texas, called The Southwest which was devoted to Southern rights. You know what some of those rights were, the right to own slaves. In 1861, when the Civil War began, he received a commission to raise a regiment in the state of Texas, and that became the 12th Texas Cavalry. He was an unrepentant rebel at the end of the war. In fact, at the end of the war, he tries to escape Texas and found a slavery colony in British Honduras, but it is ultimately unsuccessful, and he returns to Texas. Here we can see a newspaper article 
from May 2nd, 1865. This is only a few weeks after General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, effectively ending the rebellion against the Union. And so at this meeting, we have a lot of different people, including you see there, Colonel W.H. Parsons. So this is a meeting of his brigade, the 12th Texas Cavalry. And this is not a meaning to reminisce about how fun it was to fight the war, but now it's time to have peace. This is an unrepentant rebel assembly. And they pass a series of resolutions, many of them aimed at keeping the newly freed people suppressed, preventing them from getting voting rights, but also targeting Yankees who are going to be coming into the state very soon. Resolved that we pledge ourselves individually to our fellow soldiers everywhere that we will not lay down our arms as long as the breath of a Yankee miscreant pollutes the pure air of our sunny South. You gotta admit they're good with words. So with people like William Parsons running around, you can imagine there was a strong resistance to reconstruction in Texas. The Texas people and other officials are going to try and slow walk many of the reconstruction reforms and preserve as much of the old Texas as they possibly can. The first thing they do is defy a federal mandate to reorganize their government. By December 1865, all the southern states had reorganized provisional governments except for Texas. So they were the super disobedient child here. They did not elect any representatives or senators to go to Congress in 1866, unlike many of the other states. Although Congress refused to seat many of the representatives that were sent from the southern states, because many of them were recently Confederates. One of them was the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. So Congress refused to seat many of those people, but Texas didn't even send anybody. Surprise, surprise, they refused to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendments. The 13th Amendment banned involuntary servitude except as punishment of a crime. So that meant that every state's law had to conform to that amendment and not pass laws that enslaved other people. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal rights before the law, regardless of race. So that would mean that if a state wanted to pass a law that prevented Black people from serving on juries, the 14th Amendment, at least in theory, prevented that. There are federal troops in central Texas trying to keep order, but they have a very loose hold on things. We looked at the forbidding landscapes of Texas. The KKK as well is going to be rampantly attacking, and they're not the only ones. I'm using KKK as a shorthand, but there were many groups like the John Gatings group. This is an article from the Texas Republican. So this is a pro-Union, pro-North newspaper in Texas from May 15th, 1868. And this article is titled The Ku Klux Klan. It says, Ku Klux Klan is the name said to have been assumed by a secret society reported to have been established at the South. A great many outrages are charged upon that mysterious body sufficient, if the charges be true, to bring it under the condemnation of all law-abiding men. We, however, do not feel perfectly satisfied in our own mind that any such society exists. We certainly do not feel, by any means, convinced that, if it does exist, the crimes charged upon it are charged truly. For this skepticism, we plead in explanation that the threatening attitude of the radicals through their leagues of Negroes supplies a motive of self-defense before public opinion. So although this is a Republican newspaper and pro-Northerner, they do not believe the so-called rumors of this Ku Klux Klan, and they are discouraging local Black populations from arming themselves in self-defense against the Ku Klux Klan. These white supremacist terrorist groups were secret societies and they relied heavily on disbelief. What's the old saying? The devil's greatest trick is to convince the world he doesn't exist. Well, here you go. And you can maybe understand why people found it difficult to believe in such a secret society. It just seemed so far-fetched. We see further in this article, several public men in Washington received notices to prepare for death at the hands of the Klan. Bloody month, cloudy moon, death, death to traitors. The Negro must be eaten raw. Blood and clotted gore is our motto. But it wasn't just the terrorism that newly freed people and the Republicans faced. There were also incredibly restrictive black codes, laws that were passed in the year 1866, early at the end of the war, to try to preserve Texas's segregated society. 
These laws included things like an act to establish a code of criminal procedure, which prevented persons of color from testifying in court against white people. There was also a railroad act, which segregated white passengers on trains from black ones. And at this time, there's not a lot of trains in Texas, so they're going to start building railroads. And so they want to set up right from the beginning that black people will travel in separate cars. 1866, when did Rosa Parks refuse to sit in the back of the bus? If you can put that in the comment below, that's your trivia question for this video. An act to provide for the organization of militia in which only white male inhabitants of Texas would be invited to participate. Enlistment of black soldiers was a big reason why so many African-American people supported the union. And so Texas does not want those people, those loyal patriots to be in the state militia. After all, why would Texas want people who are loyal to Washington DC and the United States in their local militia when Texas has always been out for itself? Was also an act to define and declare the rights of persons lately known as slaves it included a provision that said there shall be no discrimination against such persons in the administration of criminal laws of this state so there were some improvements as well in addition to some setbacks however despite claiming that black citizens of texas would be protected under criminal law they went out of their way to prevent white and black people from marrying to prevent what was called miscegenation or interracial marriage and they did so by saying that we are not repealing any laws in Texas that prevent white and black from marrying, and also that prevent black people from serving on juries in which white people are being accused. So let's get to know the freed people of Texas a little bit. Who are they? These people have a lot in common with freed people in general across the country, but there's also a lot of specific details about their situation that makes them a lot different than your average freed person in the United States. They're concentrated in cities like Waco, and they are constantly trying to avoid confrontation with marauding whites who are prowling the plains. There's a labor boom after the Civil War, and in the post-war years, freed people find work as draymen, waiters, cooks, barbers, blacksmiths, shoemakers, and butchers, right? There's a huge demand for labor, and now that slavery has been made illegal, there's an opportunity for Black people to make some money doing the jobs that they did under slavery. Many of them acquired incredible skills, blacksmithing, masonry, and they are sought after. And so some newly freed people in this period are actually going to amass quite a nice little chunk of wealth at the end of the Civil War as this labor boom takes place. As a result of many freed people becoming prosperous, they start to become philanthropists, using their money to establish their own homes, their own families, to send their kids to school, to enter politics themselves, and even to donate money for the construction of local schools for the education of Black children. With the end of slavery, there's this big question about sexual mores, which seem to be loosening, especially those social mores around sexual intercourse between white and Black. In this period, we start to see a lot of newly freed people are entering into relationships with white people. This is going to present a problem for many of the unrepentant rebels of the area. So we'll see how they respond to that. One of the people who benefited greatly from the loosening of these moors around interracial dating was Lucy Parsons. Now, I don't want to reduce Lucy Parsons to merely a side character in the story, but unfortunately she does kind of come across as a side character in this specific story. However, I will do a video on Lucy Parsons. She had a long life and she became a very important person in the anarchist movement of the United States, which would be a great video. But in this video, we're going to be focusing on her for two primary reasons. One is interracial marriage and the other is migration as a slave. She was born on a plantation in Virginia and her name was actually Lucia or Lucia. At 12 years old, the slave owner of her farm marched her and everyone on the farm to McLennan County, Texas, all the way from Virginia. So she's one of these enslaved people who went on a long march. Lucia was lighter skinned than many of the other slaves on the farm. She was believed to be the daughter of the owner, and she even had a bit of an embarrassment about her heritage as a Black person and as a former slave. She often tried to pass for a, let's say, non-African-American so that people did not treat her like a slave. 
when she was 16 years old, a freedman named Oliver Gathings, one of these newly freed people who had acquired a little bit of wealth, actually paid for her to go to school. And he did eventually try to marry her and they may have had a baby together. As she grew older and things were loosening up, especially in the city of Waco, she became very sought after. Lucia was extremely intelligent, well-spoken, interesting person. Whereas in the past, she would have been discarded as unmarriable because she was part of the slave class. Now, many people are looking at her as a potential wife. Around 1868, Lucia had a child, but the paternity was unknown. It could have been Oliver Gathings, could have been a, one of a few people, but nobody knows for sure. One of the men it absolutely couldn't have been was a man named Albert, who she met in 1869. Albert Parsons! It's the brother of William Parsons. That's right. Albert Parsons was born in 1845, and Albert was born in Montgomery, Alabama. So he's a true Southerner here. In 1861, he joined the Lone Star Grays, a Galveston military group, and served as a powder monkey. And he served in the Confederate Army throughout the Civil War. In 1865, he moved to Waco. He traded his mule for 40 acres of land and hired freed people to harvest his land that year. And this is his first interaction interpersonally with newly freed people. After the 1867 Reconstruction Act, Parsons completely changed his tune. He became an abolitionist. He joined the Republican Party, renounced the Confederacy and slavery. So you're going to get an idea of how he ended up becoming friendly with Lucy. He was considered by many to be a violent agitator, affiliating with the worst class of Negroes, ever ready to stir them up to strife. So for many white people in the region, he's going to be a big target, even more than black people. He's the type of white person who stirs up trouble and, and fills these newly freed people's heads with ideas of power and freedom, which threaten the establishment. He possibly had a child with Lucy in 1870. So Albert and Lucy ended up starting to date at this point, and they became very close. They'll eventually marry shortly before they leave the state of Texas, but we'll talk about that later. The center point for the story is Waco, Texas. And no, we're not going to be talking about David Koresh. This is a long time after that. Waco, Texas is a thriving city, and it was a thriving city at the time that all of these people were living there. It had a thriving business district, which dealt primarily in cotton, grain, hides, wool, and flour. It was a place where the sons of the planter elite did not live, but they would often come marauding into town and ride in circles to scare the local black population. There was a red light district called the Reservation in Waco, Texas, which was legendary. Prostitution had long been legal in Waco, Texas. After the war, Waco became a refuge for freed people as a more cosmopolitan city and a place to hide from marauding killers on the plains outside of the city. Here, freed people labored for small wages and they helped build town structures like churches and schools. The Republicans realized that in this labor boom, the thing that's really going to win over the white population are the incredible internal improvements that the Republicans are going to bring. It's interesting because what did President Biden try to do when he got in office? Win the other side over with a grand infrastructure project. That did not work. This will not totally work either. Although they will manage to create some incredible pieces of infrastructure that are still with us to this day, including the Waco Suspension Bridge, which was completed in 1870, spanning the wide Brazos River. This bridge brought masses of immigrants through Waco as it was one of the only places that you could cross the Brazos River without having to caulk your wagon or ford it and cross the river at risk of drowning, Oregon Trail style. Here's another look at the Waco Suspension Bridge. What a beautiful bridge it is. And you can see that it has been a fascination for tourists. Even to this day, here's a poster. The only way to cross the Brazos via our suspension bridge. Beautiful Waco, Texas. Come to Texas, see the bridge. And it worked. Now, one of the most fascinating things about this story is what I like to call the musical governors. During this period, Texas had more governors in a shorter amount of time than I think I've ever seen in any state in history, but I may be wrong about that. In March of 1861, the governor of Texas was Sam Houston, the guy for whom the city Houston is named. He was one of the founders of Texas, the first president of the Republic of Texas, 
and a disciple and friend of President Andrew Jackson. Sam Houston became governor of Texas in the years that led up to the Civil War. And when Texas seceded, Houston refused to join the secessionists. And he ended up having to leave Texas in exile, which brought in a replacement governor, a provisional governor. Then there was a string of Confederate governors until June 1865, when Pendleton Murrah, I'm Pendleton Murrah, <laughs> gotta love that name, became the last Confederate governor of Texas. At the end of the Civil War, Pendleton Murrah actually escaped into Mexico, trying to hide away from Union authorities as they came through the state. And this brought in Andrew Jackson Hamilton, the first Republican governor, a moderate. In 1866, Texas ratified a new constitution and elected a new governor, James W. Throckmorton. Throckmorton was a Democrat and a big fan of the Confederacy. So immediately, Texas has the swing back to the Confederacy right after the ratification of its new constitution. But Throckmorton proves to be a huge problem for the military authorities, and they have him removed and replaced with a friendly governor named Elisha Peace. And Elisha Peace stays in office for a little while. Another constitution is ratified in 1869. I guess they weren't happy that Throckmorton got elected, and so they did another constitution after they deposed him. And in the aftermath of that constitution, the most radical Republican governor, the guy who you saw on the thumbnail, Edmund Jackson Davis, is elected governor. And he will remain in this post for four years and be the most radical governor that Texas has ever seen. In the end, he will be forced out of office by Richard Koch, who will be the first of many, many Democrats to come. And Richard Koch is an unrepentant rebel who will bring Texas back in many ways to the way it was before the war, although there will be some things that he will not be able to change. He will ratify a constitution in 1875, which will be the last constitution of Texas. It is the constitution that Texas has to this day. Who were the Republicans of Texas? Well, they consisted of a rather motley crew. You got freed people, people freed from slavery. Some Southern whites like Albert Parsons, reform-minded Northerners who are coming into the state, including many missionaries and teachers who are coming to educate black children, Freedmen's Bureau agents. The Freedmen's Bureau was created to assist newly freed people. However, there were two kinds of agents. Some of them were more corrupt than others. Many people joined the Freedmen's Bureau simply to get that sweet, sweet government paycheck. This is a super racist cartoon about the Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. There's also Union vets and local Germans. Django Unchained, right? There was that character in Django Unchained who is German, and that was for a specific reason. There were many German immigrants in the United States during the Civil War. Many of them were liberals who were extremely anti-slavery, and during the war, they found that they were attacked by whites. Many of them were killed and lynched for their support of anti-slavery causes and for not supporting the Confederacy. They'll also be called communists. Republicans of Texas engage in voter registration drives and building schools. Some of them are called carpetbaggers and will become the target of Democrat attacks. The Yankee who comes into Texas and tells everybody how to live, also super corrupt, right? They'll bag everything. They'll come down there and take everything. They'll bag it up. They'll even put the carpet in their bag and head back home. So this is Carl Schurz, who was a famous abolitionist in the United States and a very powerful politician. Carl Schurz was German born and a liberal. So again, anti-German sentiment. We often forget about anti-Germanism in the United States, but a lot of Germans were beaten up and killed and even interred throughout the history of the United States. Nevertheless, a slew of Republicans were elected to the 12th legislature in 1870, including Shep Mullins, who we'll talk about in a minute, Edmund Davis as governor, David F. Davis as county clerk, who helped to build uh, the school that Lucy Parsons went to, and William Parsons as senator. What? William Parsons? I thought he was an unrepentant rebel. Well, as it turned out, William Parsons saw that there was a lot of opportunity in republicanism. There was a lot of money a lot of opportunity to help secure business contracts as these internal improvements are coming in. 
and with his brother marrying a black woman and joining with the Republicans, William Parsons decided, ah, what the heck? And he put away the gray uniform and joined up with the Republicans. Now, that could be a great inspirational story about a man who changed his mind, or it could be a story of opportunism. Shepard Mullins was one of the people who benefited greatly from the Freedmen's Bureau and is a great example of someone who was able to use this period for the advancement of Black people in Texas. He was born in Alabama and trained as a blacksmith enslaved. In late 1860s, at the end of the war, he acquired some land in Waco, Texas. And he used his wages as a blacksmith, remember he's now making a lot of money as a blacksmith at the end of the Civil War, to build a school for black kids, $75 to be exact. In 1867, he becomes politically active and begins registering voters. A few months later, he serves on the platform committee of the first Republican Party convention in Texas. In 1868, after the death of a member of the Constitutional Convention, he runs successfully for election and fills the seat. And he will be one of many black people who will serve in the Texas legislature during these years. He was a member of the Committee on Public Lands, Commerce, and Manufacturing. He also became a state military commander and served a four-year term as county commissioner in McLennan County. Not only does he find a lot of money in blacksmithing, but he's now acquiring quite a lot of power politically. So what do the Republicans of Texas want? They want political representation for the newly freed. They want wage labor employment for the newly freed. They want protection from racist violence, education, major internal improvement projects, and Republican judges on the court, right? We're going to be passing a lot of laws. We don't want them getting thrown out in court. So let's fill the courts with as many Republican judges as we possibly can. 12th legislature. This is the Republican legislature, the radical legislature. It's considered the high watermark for Texas Reconstruction. 14 black senators and congressmen. It's the legislature in which the 13th Amendment was ratified, as well as the 14th and 15th, which guaranteed the right to vote regardless of the color of your skin. This legislature was split between a faction of pro-business anti-black and pro-black pro-public schools. The courts at this time are cracking down more on white terrorism. After Edmund J. Davis is sworn in as governor in April 1870, black men start to get hired as police officers. They are allowed to sit on juries. Governor Davis pursued infrastructure and business policies in order to satiate the pro-business side of the legislature. He also passed many restrictions on gun laws, which is another big issue that is still with us today. Davis also created state militias in order to police the state and protect black people from attacks from the KKK. But this also disturbed the local population. And it would disturb you if your state decided to raise a militia now, right? You would say, wait a minute, I don't know if I want my governor to have an army. This happened in Florida recently with Governor DeSantis, who called up a state militia of some sort, and people said that it was going to be his personal army. So a lot of people in Texas are against the state militia because they want Black people to be kept down, but they're also worried about their guns being taken away and about these large state militias being raised that are going to be loyal to these Republican governments, which are filled with not just Black representatives, but also many Yankees. One of the things that the 12th legislature does to really win over the population is the founding of the Waco Gaslight Company. So they provide gas lighting to the entire state of Texas. And I mean gaslight in the very literal sense of the word gaslight. In fact, this was a tactic picked up later by Lyndon Johnson, who long before he was president of the United States, ran for Senate in Texas and won over the population and won support as a Democrat by providing electrification to the homes of the people of Texas. So it shows you the power of internal improvements. And this is one of the best cards that the Republicans have to play during this time. Education. Education. The Freedmen's Bureau was created by Abraham Lincoln in March of 1865 and run by O.O. O. Howard, for whom the historic Black College Howard University is named. They opened 16 public schools, six night schools, and there were over a thousand pupils in those schools in Texas in 1865. Freedmen contributed to the schools. Teachers were provided from the North. Many of the missionaries, think like Peace Corps or um, I think it's called AmeriCorps or something. 
Over time, control of the schools passed to the local black population who funded them. So the goal was to get in there, establish the schools, and then get out and let the black population support the schools themselves. 10,000 freed people were taught to read in the year 1866. Federal government often snuck money into the school system through bureaucratic back channels, and this provided fodder for criticism, allowed the Democrats to say, hey, you use that money unfairly to educate black children when white kids, blah, 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 don't get this and that. You can probably piece it together. Unfortunately, with so many schools being established, white terror attacks were rampant. People are trying to stop the advancement of black people at its root, prevent them from going to school. 4,000 newly freed people were enrolled in school by 1870, which was up from a total of 20 in 1850. 20 people were in school, 20 black people total in Texas were in school in 1850, 4,000 by 1870. On January 1st, 1869, the Freedmen's Bureau officially closed in Texas. It had a lot of problems and corruption and ultimately it could not sustain itself. That is when the Bureau's support of schools ended. And remember that with all of these schools being built for newly freed people, it's creating a boom in the building of schools generally. A lot of white kids, poor white families, are benefiting from what's happening as well as they are able to, for the first time in their lives, go to school. It's also going to create some problems because many white families don't want their kids to go to school. They'd much rather them be home working on the farm. Maybe someday I'll do a video on child labor laws. Uh, Southern agrarian populists vehemently opposed child labor laws because it took children whose labor was very needed on the farms off of the farms and put them in school. And here's a photo of one of the black schools that was in Texas. And you can see that not only are there many black children here, but there are also native children, possibly Mexican children. And some of the teachers are black but there's also a white teacher in the back who is probably from the North. You can see a sign, God bless our school. A lot of the schools were built by missionaries, religious Christians, Quakers. So there was always a heavy element of patriotism and religion in the schools, which should give you some sense about why public schools became the first place where the Pledge of Allegiance was spoken and why it was such a fight to get public schools to secularize. But yeah. And there's a couple of white kids there too. Just notice that. Unfortunately, all this progress was headed for a major downfall. In 1872, the 12th legislature lost a good number of its representatives to the Democrats. In 1873, Edmund J. Davis was defeated by Richard Koch in a contested election. Richard Koch, the unrepentant rebel, won the governorship two to one. However, the Texas Supreme Court ruled his election invalid. Koch ignored the Supreme Court's ruling and was inaugurated on January 17th, 1874. Davis was the last Republican governor of Texas until 1978. As Democrats dominated for the next 105 years, the rollback of Republican policies began. William Parsons moved to New York. Shep Mullins died. Albert and Lucy Parsons moved to Chicago. Many of the state's black police officers were fired and the new militias formed to protect blacks were disbanded. A new constitution was adopted by the Koch government in 1876 and is Texas's constitution to this day. But one thing that the Democrats of Texas will continue is this vast new system of schools that has been established by the Republicans of Texas. And so these actions aimed at educating newly freed people are going to create the foundation for public education in Texas. A lot of times we look at Reconstruction as a period of missed opportunities, and we certainly should look at it that way. But we also have to recognize that some of the accomplishments of these people were damn right heroic. We saw tens of thousands of people get educated in Texas in the first years after the war. And so this foundation of an educational system is not nothing. It's going to give a lot of Black people in Texas and around the country opportunities to rise that they never had before. I'd like to mention now just a few things about the ignominious end of Edmund Davis's governorship. This is an article that came out in the Washington Post referencing Edmund Davis and Richard Koch in the election of 1873. 
It came out in 2020 when President Trump refused to support the election results that year. The situation was a little bit different, but Governor Davis did claim that there was widespread fraud in the election of 1873 and refused to step down as governor. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor, but Richard Koch uh, gathered as many of his forces as he could and marched on to the Capitol demanding that he be sworn in. Edmund Davis locked himself in his office and frantically wired President Ulysses Grant, begging him to send federal troops into Texas and protect his government. But Grant ultimately refused, and Davis was forced to step down. But before he did, he locked the door of the governor's office so that when Governor Koch entered the building, they were actually forced to break a glass door and reach over and unlock the office from the inside so that the governor could use his office. So compared to the Clinton staff removing all the W's from the keyboard when George W. Bush came to the White House, this is a lot worse. And speaking of George W. Bush, this is an unrelated but neat fact that I found about this story. Richard Koch became governor in 1874, and for 105, 104 years, we had Democrats only as governors in Texas. Until 1978, when Bill Clements became the first Republican governor of the state of Texas. He was succeeded by Ann Richards, who was a Democrat, and then he won again, and then Ann Richards beat him again. And Ann Richards remained governor until 1995, when George W. Bush beat her in that famous election, which set him on a course to become president of the United States. Now, many of us know the legacy of George W. Bush as president, but few of us know that he actually founded a governor's dynasty in Texas before becoming president. After all, Bush was succeeded by Rick Perry, who was succeeded by Greg Abbott, who is the governor today. So Texas has had only Republican governors since 1995. Once they pick a party, they really like to stick with it. As for Albert Parsons, this is another story I want to do a video on someday. Albert and Lucy Parsons moved to Chicago for fear that their marriage would be annulled by the new anti-miscegenation laws. They wanted to live together as husband and wife, and so they moved to the North. They were part of a major migration of formerly enslaved people and Republicans who moved to the North after the reclaiming of the South, after the end of Reconstruction. Albert Parsons became an outspoken anarchist and labor organizer and even helped to organize the protests in Chicago in the late 1870s that resulted in a riot at the Haymarket Square. This is the infamous Haymarket Affair. And during this riot, there was actually a huge bomb that went off and many people were killed. And so six of the organizers of that protest, including Albert Parsons, were hanged for their crimes. Although it was never proven that Albert Parsons ordered any bombings or attacks Simply by gathering all those people together, they reasoned that he, among his friends, were conspirators and they were hanged. Now widowed, Mrs. Parsons becomes a fierce proponent for anarchism and for labor rights. Here we can see a picture of her in her later years, flanked by a poster announcing one of her lectures. Mrs. Parsons, wife of the condemned anarchist, will deliver a free lecture at Kumps Hall, December 20th, 1886. Everybody should avail themselves of this opportunity to hear the most talented and eloquent woman of the age. I think my next video on Lucy Parsons is gonna have to be about how she and Emma Goldman had this huge argument and a big falling out during the anarchist movement, but we'll save that for another presentation. And so, that brings us to the end of our story today. The Black Republicans of Texas. I hope you enjoyed this program. This is a subject that I could have learned a lot more about, but this is as much as I could really get together that I thought would be of interest to help maybe put a little taste of the topic on your tongue and encourage you to go out and research this subject on your own. Thanks for watching today. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, that always helps. Every little bit keeps me going. But more than anything else, I just like to know that you enjoy these videos and that you get something worthwhile out of watching them. So hope you have a lovely rest of your day, lovely rest of your week, and I wish you all the best.